Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to talk about layouts, thumbnails, roughs. I feel like all those words are interchangeable. I feel like uh, once every six months, man, one of our cartoonist brethren out there, they put the blast out. Um, you know, they start new books and they're looking for inspiration, and they are curious about different approaches to tackling the thumbnails, so we're going to create the resource for such a thing. It's a good place to start. So thumbnails, breakdowns, these are kind of like storyboards might be in film or something. They're a plan, they're a visual plan. Some artists will even write in this format, which is pretty amazing to me, and we'll see some examples of that. But we're gonna start here with, uh, this is from Steve Rude's sketchbook. This is the first time I really saw this, and I had met a cartoonist, Ernie Steiner, one of the first working professionals who took some time to look at my portfolio, really my sketchbooks, and kind of steer me in a direction. And this is one of the things he showed me was like page layouts, which, you know, in the beginning, everybody is just doing, uh, you're just doing pinups, of course. And so um, if you want to make comics, the step is to go from just doing pinups and covers to actually drawing pages. And this is one of the things that Ernie Steiner pulled off the shelf to kind of illustrate how you do page layouts, how you approach you know, actually doing a story on a page. And so one interesting note about this one is this is approximately actual size. This is an entire issue of Nexus by Steve Rude, all on one piece of paper. And he gives some information about uh, Mike Barron, the writer of Nexus, would do little thumbnails in his scripts, like working out his scripts. And this is an example of what Mike Barron would send, and then he would just very quickly, Steve Rude, start doing these rough sketches in the margin, trying to work out layouts for himself. And that would graduate into this, basically a working issue. And what he outlines here is if it's readable at this small, tiny size, it'll be readable at comic book page size. So those are some of the things that I took away from my initial exposure to this concept. Seems to be a good rule of thumb. And uh, Steve Root is one of those guys who put who puts in that work, man. He's, his sketchbooks are famous, so it's very cool that we have an example of this to take a look at. One of the most famous, uh, highly respected comic book writers in American comics history is Harvey Kurtzman. And rose to fame at EC Comics, where he was working as an editor of several books, and that meant writing the stories and doing layouts. So he was a guy who would be writing in this layout format for other artists. And this biography, uh, Art of Harvey Kurtzman, really nice biography, a lot of great art reproduced in here, including some of those layouts. So this is from Lost Battalion Thumbnails from Two-Fisted Tales, uh, one of the books that he edited, you know, War Comics, very famously. And you can see this is like uh, Stenopad, you know, like, it, like <laughs> it's probably this big in real life, and he's drawing the entire short story, you know, two by three inches or something approximately for these pages. Very, very loose, circles for heads, um, very simple, about as basic as you can get. He would go from this very rough layout to a more revised, tighter layout. And if you compare this, if you have this book, this page is actually this page. So take a look at this page, and then you can see this is a more refined layout. And a lot of these layouts are built that way. Uh, not just Harvey Kurtzman's, but in general. You know, we're going to show some examples of our layouts, and they're iterations. You know, it's not a first draft necessarily. It may be a couple of versions before you get to the first draft, and then you do a revision, and then maybe a couple revisions. Uh, Harvey Kurtzman, very famous for doing extensive writing and revisions in these kind of layout formats and, and basically going through like several layouts. But it's really cool to me to see, you know, super rough, revised, and then finished art. You know, this would be handed off in most cases to another artist to do like the final illustration type work. And, and, this, and, and this is what I've always uh, am talking about whenever uh, I mentioned how Kurtzman like reigns in the great EC artists. Because if you compare, say, a Wally Wood uh, strip from one of the Kurtzman books to a Wally Wood sci-fi strip from Weird Science, it's arranged completely differently. I uh, Kurtzman tames the horse and really turns the, these guys who draw pretty pictures into impeccable storytellers, and that's what these roughs provide. Yeah, and, you know, keeping with what I said about Steve Rude, if it's readable in this little small format, 
then yes, go nuts on the illustration at full size, and it'll it'll still be legible as a comic. It'll still make sense in terms of storytelling. You better get those guns right, though, man. If you're drawing shit for Harvey Kurtzman, a lot of stories about that, man. Drew, drew the drew the wrong machine gun. So, uh, Kurtzman had a long career. And as I said, famous for doing a lot of drafting, writing in his drafts. This is from uh, Little Annie Fanny, a strip that was highly polished in terms of illustration for Playboy magazine, done with Will Elder, um, you know, one of the great illustrators to come out of that EC troupe. And so this is kind of like a progression looking at some of the layouts and notes and revisions as they go through this progression. One of his techniques uh, that definitely existed at this stage was using tracing paper. And this is this is a... This is a philosophy that Art Spiegelman brought to his work. Uh, you, you do the initial thumbnails, you do the initial roughs, and then you lay a piece of tracing paper over top of it in a different color ink you add to the thing. Then you put another piece of tracing paper over top of it, different color ink, and you just keep building things up to get to this place right here. Yeah, it's, it's a viable way. A lot of cartoonists work that way. Um, I, I know somebody that went through the MFA program under David Mazzucchelli, and, and he kind of taught that way. You know, if just you just do these drafts, you know, and you keep improving and addressing the parts that are unclear. Example of the different color, you know, working on top or making revisions in a different color so you see this note, essentially. A uh, cartoonist that's had a big influence on me is Dan Klaus. In his modern cartoonist monograph, we see one of his stories, one of his short stories, Care Catcher, and it's going through that process. And in interviews, he would talk about kind of changing up his process from story to story. So I don't know that he works this way all the time, but in this case, he kind of wrote this story out in the thumbnail format. And so you can see here the 16 pages in their very first iteration, or at least you know, sort of the first organized iteration. You know, there may be notes and sketches before this, but extremely simple. Again, similar to the Harvey Kurtzman, we're seeing circles for heads, you know, kind of just a shape for a body. So very loose compositions, but enough for him to kind of get the idea on paper in a, in a visual manner. And what's different uh, with these compared to some of the earlier notes we've seen from the other guys is that uh, each of these is probably a single piece of uh, typing paper, eight and, a, eight and a half by 11. Guy was lettering on the thing too, man, so he needed space to, to, to write his damn story, but he didn't get mixed up with minutia, and he kept all of the compositions very, very simple along the way. And then you can see this revised second draft of page layouts for caricature. Um, still somewhat loose, but definitely much more tighter, much more visual information in these drawings. Um, starting to get a sense of light and composition. Whenever uh, you're doing stuff at this level, do you also start to make note of uh, reference material? Like, that's something that, that comes to my mind. So, for instance, if I was drawing that first page and I was drawing this, like, shot into the, the front of a car, uh, in my mind, it's like, okay, I'm going to have to, like, go do some sketching uh, from some cars outside, go find, like, an old hoopty to draw. Like, that's something that I'm kind of filibustering and figuring out what I need to get this page to, to ring true. Yeah, I definitely do that. I'll even make notes about color ideas sometimes. Yeah. You know, like, like this is definitely like my note working kind of stage. So any ideas that pop into my head, I am putting notes right on these things because this is kind of my guide. Yeah. And then you can see the finished title page from the story. Great story. We'll do a book club episode on that, on that, on that story. For sometime. sure. I have a couple of examples of Frank Miller, one of the first cartoonists that I really followed, and probably one of the first times I saw an example of this layout and didn't realize quite what I was looking at. As Miller did Daredevil, started out drawing it, then took over writing and was writing and penciling, and then ceded the penciling to Klaus Janssen, so he was then doing kind of like rough layouts, and Janssen was doing the finished art. And if you see the credits here, Frank Miller, writer, storyteller, Klaus Janssen, penciler, inker, colorist. Just pretty amazing. Great team up. Yeah. That, that's a tag team champion uh, for a long time when those guys are working together. But the interesting thing of this book, this is Daredevil 188. You see your title page here, all finished and printed. And in the back, instead of a letters column, they show Frank Miller's rough layout. And so it, this is one of those early examples where it'd be like, wait, how does this 
what am I seeing here? Uh, you know, and you can compare and contrast that first page with this rough layout, and it's the same idea, but all the detail is left to your finisher, in this case, Klaus Janssen, and, and why not? You know, guy can do everything. But it's interesting to start to see, like, oh, so Miller's turning these things in in a very rough format at this point. And so on screen now are a couple of examples of pages and, you know, interior pages with panels and stuff to kind of show that, that breakdown in a little greater detail uh, between Frank Miller's layouts and Klaus Janssen's finishes. So, Ed, you mentioned resources that somebody that's interested in layouts might want to take a look at. This is one of my favorites, another Frank Miller collaboration. This is the um, Absolute Batman Year One edition. This one reproduces David Mazzucchelli's layouts along with Frank Miller's script. This is an amazing resource for exactly process stuff and, and trying to think about how do you translate from story to visual. In this case, Mazzucchelli going very differently than the Steve Root examples or the Harvey Kurtzman, super detailed. And I believe these are drawn at one quarter of the original art size. Um, sometimes you'll see, uh, if it's maybe a full color scan, you can actually see like the DC paper in DC on some of these. And you'll see that he basically took a page of art and divided it in, in half and in half to get this size. Around, Pretty big for layouts. Around this this period of time, uh, and if I was prepared, I would have ran and grabbed mine, but there was this arcane tool called, called a ratio wheel or a proportion wheel, and you would have this thing, and you, very often in the margin you would see like a percentage, 167%. Right. And uh, you... you you come to that number by using the little proportion wheel. There's an inner circle, there's an outer circle, and uh, there's a hole in the middle of the inner circle. You, you twist the thing, and uh, you twist it to the exact proportions of your original, and then it'll point you to the percentage you need to blow the thing up on a Xerox machine to then go light box the thing. Very easy to do in Photoshop now. Yeah, and the in-between stage would be projectors. Like, we know cartoonists of a certain generation or age where they would do their layouts small. You know, it's a little bit easier to draw and control proportions and things. And then they would use a projector to actually transfer that from the kind of rough stage onto their finished big boards for the, uh, for the final art. David Mazzucchelli also talked about, like, line quality in these. So they're hyper-detailed, and it informed kind of the, the finished look of this page of what he would describe as the dumb line, yeah. which was uh, a really interesting stylistic innovation for a book like Batman and superhero books in general. And I think this reprints all of his layouts, the entire script and all the layouts. So this is the best Batman Year One edition, but man, these layouts are just amazing. I Something to marvel at. Uh, frankly, I think this is the best package put out by the big two, either of the big two ever. Like, you, everybody should have a copy of the absolute Batman Year One if they're a fan of this material. Yeah, and I guess uh, it's, it's worth noting, this is actually two books. One reproduces the original newsprint coloring edition of these comics. Yeah, which is this. And then one reprints like the deluxe collection, which Richmond Lewis went in and repainted all the color art uh, for the graphic novel collections. But it's interesting to see those two, especially if you're familiar with the old coloring palettes. Um, Richmond Lewis made these coloring palettes sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and she and she used the you know on the deluxe paper and stuff. She used the fact that, and she made note of the fact that that paper is white. So the color is going to translate differently on white paper than on that old kind of gray yeah. uh, newsprint. And she makes that sing too. The, la the lady just knows what the fuck she's doing. Yeah. One more heavy hitter before we get to our own gimmicks. This is another one of those great resources if you're trying to figure out layouts and, and maybe draw some inspiration or break all your pencils. This could go <laughs> either, either direction. But uh, Watching the Watchmen is a book of Dave Gibbons' layouts for Watchmen. Super detailed. Absolutely gorgeous to look at. Um, you know, they read clearly. I'm not sure the size of these. This may be actual size. I don't think so. I think I remember reading that he got eight of those to fit on a piece of, like, you know, A3, A4, whatever the small one is. Um, they're just kind of like, you know, Chip Kid did his thing and divvied them up however he did. But... Uh, they're, they're small as fuck, basically. Yes, very felt, small. Felt-tip pen. And very nice to see, you know, like, finished panel rendered printed piece versus sketch layout tiny, you know, concept. Uh, 
it's interesting what information is included and this varies from artist to artist and really what you're going for in this case a lot of attention to lighting you know this is a very noir moody piece of uh, storytelling and so that's important information at this st at this stage yeah he he and Klaus are also the letters of their pages too so you see a lot of kind of breakdowns kind of like allowing him to know how much real estate he has to draw, where the lettering placement's going to go. Very helpful th stuff for a cartoonist. I think the lettering thing is big. That's something that I'll see variation on layouts. Some artists will include it and some won't. Sometimes you're writing your script after the fact. But whenever I have a script to work from, whether it's mine or someone else's, I include lettering placements because it's part of reading. You know, it's part of the composition. Before we get out of here, should we show some examples of our own uh, roughs and things? Absolutely. This is a script for uh, one of my Street Angel books from Image. Street Angel goes to Juvie. I think I've talked in the past. I would print out my scripts, staple them together so I could carry them and work on them on the road. Uh, before we even go past this, was this maybe an idea for a cover design? Or you were just kind of riffing, having fun? I was just fooling around. That's fair. I, I, like the, I like these scripts, and I end up carrying them around for a couple of months while I'm working on the book. So sometimes I feel like doodling on the cover more than drawing the actual pages. I do, uh, so, you know, this is my working draft, and I, I would write a very detailed script with uh, Brian Maruka, and it would have a lot of information, and then this would become the Bible. Like, I would move off screen and onto this surface, and so you can see these are your typical page layouts. This is what we've been showing. Um, in this case, you know, it's one page, but it's several drafts, several iterations, and I'll number, like, the ones that I'm going for, you know, like, oh, use this panel for number five. Um, you know, just basically my way of trying to get the panel that I need. Yeah, give um, yourself options, man. Like, uh, you very rarely do you get things right uh, the, the first time. It's not it's not the SATs. Yes, exactly. And then, Ed, you, you mentioned, do I note, you know, research, or uh, if I'm going to have to look something up or find reference for it. And in some cases, and of course I can't find one when I want it, I would have, like, character design, you know, if I had a new character There's or something coming up. There's one on the very up, first page. That's true, there is. Although that's not a great character design, <laughs> since it's only one. But as I would get, uh, you know, to a point where I needed a character, I would just do the design on the page. You know, that would be part of, like, this is my visual research, essentially. And whatever I'm going to draw, usually I would just draw it directly onto these scripts. Um, as I said, I was carrying them around in backpacks with me wherever I was going for while I was working on this stuff. So whatever I needed would go down here first, as opposed to, say, a sketchbook. Makes a lot of sense. And this story in particular is all grids. So you see a lot of those grid, you know, like all of these are just different grid layouts, um, sometimes very precise grid layouts. Let me ask you, when you start to translate these things to uh, the final printed page, do you uh, blow these up, put them in blue lines? Like, is this, you're just eyeballing the dimensions and shit? It's just, it's just pure compositional ideas and shit at this stage. Yeah, and also a rough draft. You yeah. know, whenever I would go to the full page, I would actually redraw them, you know, completely. I wasn't blowing anything up. And that was the next draft because right. then I would light box that drawing, you know, so like each, you know, there's probably four or five drafts per page if you go through all of these different steps. Right. And you would light box the, the other drawing because uh, you didn't ink, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah this, this was a story I did in pencil. So you wanted a clean pencil line for, a lot of uh, sense. for scanning purposes. And this is sort of my approach when I uh, put X-Men together. Now, when we were talking about like the first draft, like the first draft happened earlier than this. Right, yes. Uh, in fact, I would print up, uh, I guess I took them out of there, man, but I I had basically uh, divided by four, and I would basically do thumbnails on that. Um, but I'm basically doing a lot of the writing here, and the idea is uh, the workable prototype, man. Just see if this thing makes any kind of sense as a comic. Uh, these would take, even though you see a lot of pen marks on this thing, these would take an hour to draw. You know, nothing is precious, man. I'm not paying much attention to any anatomy or any of that sort of stuff. But when I would ar arrive at an image that I think works, something like this, I would blow that up and uh, just, like, light box it and then, like, start to add lighting and, and tighten everything up. But That makes sense because a lot of times you'll have some quality in these sketches in, that are loose and that feel alive. And in cartooning, that's so important, having that, that sense of life in these characters. And it doesn't always translate as you refine and, and redraw. Um, so whenever you have a pose you like or a composition, 
being able to transfer that's important. Yeah, and that's just that's an old kind of Qbert school trick. But then, like this thing in the final printed book, completely different composition because, like, you start to just become a little bit more aware of like what you need. Whenever you're a kid starting out, you're drawing a thing and you're so excited to see what this is going to look like that you just start going in and drawing. And then at the end, I often would think, oh man, if I would have just like moved things over, but now it's too late. There's no excuse for that. As a professional, figure that shit out, man. You need blueprints to make the house. Yeah, that's what you're, that's part of what you need out of your process is that ability to make these revisions and to improve on the a draft. Ed, are these what you would show your editor? I would. Like, I was in a position, like, uh, working with new people, people who didn't know me, and uh, I refused to do extra work, basically. Like, they, they didn't pay me enough for me to redraw some shit. So it's like, let's get it at this stage. If you're comfortable with it at this stage, I'm going to get to it. You know, I'm going to start getting busy, and it, it, there won't be much ad-libbing, basically. Um... It's so interesting to see these. I, I love this kind of stuff. I was reading these on an airplane. You had given me a draft in this form. Right. And, uh, and my, my person sitting next to me was an older lady and was kind of looking over my shoulder and had to ask. Like, she couldn't help herself. She, this this caught her, piqued her curiosity. It does look like it's done by a mental patient. <laughs> she, she probably thought you worked in a, in a home of sorts. I think she enjoyed the, uh, the comics part and, and was surprised to see that on the airplane next to her. Yeah, so that's essentially my process. Basically, I think what the kayfabers out there realize and understand is that what they are reading on the final printed page is not the first attempt. If you're a maker of comics and you weren't exactly aware of this, how liberating is that? You don't got to get it right at the first time. Try a few. My first Street Angel was done with no layouts. The first published comics I ever really made um, I didn't know any better, and uh, whenever I went to work on the Plain Janes for, for, with an editor or with a real publisher, that was the first time that it was required that I turn in layouts, and there were different reasons for that, but I like that you show these layouts, Ed, because a lot of times the layouts do go to an editor or a publisher or some collaborator in that process, and they need to be able to read them. You know, like some of the stuff I was showing in those Street Angel layouts, that wouldn't work for anybody except for me. Totally. Like, they were going to me, so I understood what those scribbles meant. But same as the Harvey Kurtzman examples where it's like, here's his rough draft, and then a slightly revised version goes to the artists that, he, that are supposed to understand that rough draft. I don't know, man. Looking at all of these thumbnails that we just looked at, uh, it's got me jazzed up to get back to making comics, man. Should we get the hell out of here? Yeah, let's wrap it up. All right, guys. Like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon, and it'll notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise in our spread shop, link below the video. Like we said, man, we're getting back to making comics, but you know your marching orders. Read more comics.